All right, all right. Uh, let's get this thing going. Um, I don't have a lot of time, and I want to examine an issue that's probably a little different than what you might think of. I, I'm not going to talk a ton about the football and my own experiences or hair care products, okay? But <laughs> I'm going to try something here, new here. So what I want to talk about is stories, okay? I want to talk about stories and the power of storytelling, okay? Whether it's the stories that we tell ourselves, the stories that we tell each other, the stories that we've been told that have been passed down from ages ago, I think there's an inherent power in it, okay? A power to move, a power to inspire, and a power to change. Um, and I want to talk about two stories, and specifically this time, um, how they interact with each other and what we can use, how we can use one to learn from another. The first is one that you know very well. Uh, simply stated, it's called The Scandal. Uh, on November 5th, 2011, a grand jury report was dropped, and Penn State has never been the same since. Uh, the fallout was swift and also prolonged. Uh, board meetings and news coverage, football games, hirings and firings of coaches, uh, NCAA sanctions and criminal trials, the lot of it. All together, all because of this, all because of November 2011. But the one thing about November 2011 that I've never really heard stated before, and that I think is extremely fascinating, is that in November 2011, nothing actually happened. Okay? That's not to minimize what happened prior, the prior atrocities of 8, 10, or 12 years ago, but that was almost a decade prior. What happened in November of 2011 was a revelation of information. There was no shooter on campus. There was no you know, serial killer on the loose. There was no bombing or anything like that. Any other you know, type of event we associate with being tragic or traumatic. What happened in November of 2011 was the telling of a story. The second story I want to talk about all right, is one that you also might know. Um, it's called The Dark Knight Rises. All right? And it's a movie. Uh, it came out in Ju July 2012. And so in that time, I was embroiled in my role as a Penn State football player, a backup quarterback for the team. Um, just about a week prior to seeing it, uh, the free report dropped, so I had that on my mind. Um, and then even a couple days later, the NCAA sanctions would come out, um, unbeknownst to us at the time. Um, so I was kind of thinking about these issues in my head during our summer training and everything. Um, so when I walked out of the movie on that Friday night in July, I couldn't help but start making connections. Okay. Connections I saw between the story that, I was, that was playing out in my own real life and the story I had just found, saw on the screen. Um, this might sound kind of wild and everything, but just roll with me on it. I swear I'm getting somewhere. Um, but the thing about The Dark Knight Rises, um, hopefully, so who, who's seen it? Hands? Anybody seen it? Good. All right, nice. Okay. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, a very quick uh, synopsis. There's this arch-terrorist okay, named Bane who has come to Gotham, which is like New York City, and he wants to destroy it. Okay, um, I'm actually going to show a clip here in a few seconds, okay, um, and this is what happens whenever Bane wants to unleash his plan. Okay, for the first third of the movie, Bane is like kind of working under the table in secret, planting bombs and doing things that a lot of people don't know that are happening, but there comes a time when he wants to take his story and make it public, okay, and this is that scene. Let the games begin. I know that's only a quick clip, about a minute long, um, and there are a multitude of, of comparisons that I think I could talk about. I could probably write like a small dissertation on it, uh, but I only have a couple minutes. So this is the scene that I want to focus on. Um, I think there are three interesting, interesting things about that scene and how it connects to the two stories. The first is that 
the complete irony of it happening in a football stadium, okay? The scandal happened right around the football program. The second is not necessarily what Bain does, but what he did not do, okay? Um, if Bain had the power to blow up the surface of the field of the football stadium, I reason to believe that he could have just blown up the whole stadium and achieved many more deaths and much more destruction than he, than he did with what he did. If Bain wanted to blow up the bridges and, and seal the subway shut with, with explosions and everything like that, I feel like he could have probably just blown up the uh, more populated areas of the city or a larger building, which would have caused many more deaths and much more destruction. But he didn't, okay? Because if, if all the world's a stage, like one storyteller once put it, Bain isn't trying to screw up the theater, okay? He's just trying to make the actors work off the script. And not off the script in a comfortable way, but under a great, great stress. And that is the stress of fear. Because what he does with this, he shows a viewing audience this act of destruction, this act of this city crumbling around them, and many more there on television, and he shows them what can happen. In the scene directly after that scene, he actually walks right onto the field and tells the people that, the, oh yeah, there's also a nuclear bomb in the city, all right? And so if anyone tries to come help, isolate, help the isolated city, the bomb's gonna blow, and you'll never know when it's gonna happen. He seeks to create fear, because fear leads to chaos, and chaos leads to destruction. And if Bain doesn't have to destroy the city himself, he's going to let the people do it for him. Now, that's a very extreme example. Um, but when I saw this scene and I saw this movie, I thought a lot about November of 2011. Okay? You can, I couldn't tell you how many questions of, of essentially fear were asked. What's our school going to be like? What's the reputation going to be? What's going to happen next? Where do we go from here? Questions which led to uncertainty, all derived from fear. Uh, but the interesting thing about fear is that it's a problem of the mind, okay? And that's where the game is played. And probably the biggest question of all um, that I saw was, or that I heard, was what do we do? I was part of several different meetings with other students on campus in November 2011 and in the months afterwards of what can we do? What kind of campaign can we make? And some strides were made, um, some cool things like the We Still Are campaign and, and a couple other things. But the, remaining, the question remained, what can we do to help our university up against this large and overwhelming problem? What can I, as one person, or we as just a few people, actually do? To find the answer to that question, I think we need to look at the third interesting thing about that scene. And that is, who is not there? Okay. It's the Dark Knight, Batman. Nowhere to be found. Gotham is being destroyed, and he's not there. Now, where is he? Those of you that have seen the movie might know, but in the, for those of you that haven't, in the scene immediately before this, Bane and the Dark Knight, Bruce Wayne, engage in a fist-to-fist -fist combat, okay? And, some, and Bane actually whoops him up pretty good, you know, big time, <laughs> all right? Takes him almost to near death, a broken body. And after that, he takes him and throws him in this prison. It's this pit, almost like a literal hell hole, of just like imagine a well with a, a larger entrance and goes all the way down with these steep sides of stone to this prison where people go, where they throw prisoners just to rot, to stay. And so Bane throws Batman there and he, and he leaves him there and, he, and before he leaves he tells him, look, you're going to die here and you know what? Your city's going to burn too and you can't do anything about it. It's a pretty helpless state. It's a pretty precarious position to be, position to be found in. Uh, but Batman had a choice. He could have just said, hey, I've done what I could. That's all she wrote. I guess this is the end of the line for me and my city. Uh, but he didn't. Okay. He chose to do the other thing. He chose to take action. And not just action like the everyday things, because that wouldn't have cut it. That's not going to get him out of that prison. He chose to take bold, focused audacious action, okay? He trained his body, somehow got himself rehabilitated through his, his workouts there and there in his own cell, that he wants to train himself to try to climb out of this thing, okay? And he trained his mind, too, to conquer his fear, because there were no locks in this prison. Anybody could just kind of crawl out if they wanted to, but no grown man ever had. And so finally, that's what he did. Somehow found the way, found the courage, found the strength to climb out of this literal hellhole, and try to go save his city. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that a terrorist came, you know, to, to Happy Valley in, in November 2011, or that, you know, our city got totally destroyed, but mentally, I think it almost did, you know. We were in the same state as Batman, up against the odds. What should we do? And what I suggest, and what I've seen a lot of in, in the past, but I also want to almost challenge everyone here and everyone out there to do more is to take bold, audacious, focused action. I know everybody does stuff every day, just like I do, but the thing I always kind of have to fight against is the ability to just cruise, the ability to just be kind of mediocre, or the ability to just settle for good when great is out there. You know, Batman had a good run. No one would have faulted him if he would have just died there in that in that prison, but he said, no, I'm going to be great. I'm going to go save my city. Because I think the coolest things that I ever find are when I hear that story about somebody doing something great in the world, and oh yeah, they're a Penn Stater, you know. Or I turn on the television, all right, and I see a national championship game being played, and yep, Penn State's in the lead. Or I walk by even something on campus, walk by the liberal arts building, and I see a sign that says how Joseph Heller, another very famous storyteller, um, wrote the classic Catch-22 book, um, and the idea for that book came and germinated while he was here on this campus working as a professor. Great people doing great things for their university and representation of their university. Um, so what do you do? If you're a professor, you teach, you research, whatever you do, harder than you've ever done before. If you're a player, you play harder than you've ever done before. All right, if you're a janitor, if you're an office person, if you're somebody who's an alum who's not even connected to Penn State anymore physically, you do what you do harder and better than ever before. Okay. Because when we do that, we can realize that the scar that the scandal left is never going to go away. But a scar doesn't break down the whole body. A scar can often be something that helps the body propel itself and inspire itself to go to new heights. If we really do that, and we take that bold, focused, audacious action, we can realize that we write the next chapter of this Penn State story with our souls. And that we could write the next chapter of the Penn State story with our lives. Thank you.